Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, relining a propane forge. Today I'll be relining my propane forge. If you're interested in making your own forge, the lining process is about half the job. So watching this will show you a good portion of what you need to know if you want to make your own forge like I did making this one about 20 years ago. So if you want a little more information about forge design, check out my video on that subject in the cards. Now, like I said, if you're planning on making a forge, this video will show you basically about 50% of the job. So even if you don't have a forge yet, this will help you make one. This stuff right here is called ends wool or KO wool, I forget. Those are both brand names for similar products. Let's just say it's ends wool. Whatever the case, it's a refractory insulator. I bought mine in bulk from High Temp Tools quite a few years ago. Refractory just means that it's resistant to heat. So instead of being made from conventional spun glass, like the insulation in your house, it's basically a fancy glass that includes alumina, silica, and sometimes other things like zirconia, making it more suitable for the high temperatures found in blacksmithing forges. Anyway, this material can be bent and formed to fit any shape just like the pink stuff in your house. As you can see, this forge is way overdue for a new lining. In fact, you can see the exterior shell glowing where the insulation was completely toast on one side of the forge. That makes it really inefficient, and it still gets up to the temperatures that I need to forge well, but takes a lot more gas than necessary to do it. So the first task is to remove the burners and pull out all the old stuff. You'll notice I'm wearing heavy rubber gloves and a respirator. Now this stuff's not asbestos, but it irritates your throat and your skin, so I'm as cautious as is practical to be. I also have garbage bags wrapped around my arms, which is what all the cool kids do. But aside from making me look like a dork, it does a pretty good job of keeping my arms from getting covered with itchy fibers. So there we are, nice clean forge shell. I'll be putting two layers of ends wool in the forge. This material is about an inch thick, so that'll give me a two inch thick interior and really good insulation. I measure the diameter of the shell, subtract an inch, and then use a little high school geometry to guesstimate the length of the ends wool I'll need. Then I'll roll it up a little tighter than the bore of the forge, slide it in, and monkey around with it until I've got it formed to the shell. Then more geometry, more cutting, and we'll slide in the second layer. You can skip the geometry and waste some material, but this stuff ain't cheap. So I might as well get some use out of all those hours I spent sitting around in Miss What's-Her-Name's class in 10th grade. You have to be a little more careful about this second layer. You'll notice that I'm putting the ends in the bottom of the forge. The reason for that is that I'm going to be covering the bottom of the forge with an additional material. So that'll cover up that joint. If you leave the joint exposed, it's real easy for the edges to start fraying and tearing up and then the inside of your forge degrades faster than it needs to. Next, I'll cut the holes where the burners are placed. When I designed this fine specimen of a forge 20 or so years ago, I made provision for four burners, but I've never needed more than two, so that's all I'm putting back here. and then the extremely attractive homemade burners go back onto the forge. You know, if I made these today, they would be way better crafted and undoubtedly look really engineery and awesome, but they wouldn't work much better. Done. Next, I'll coat the entire surface of the ends wool 
with a refractory mortar called Satanite. Yes, that's not Satanite, it's Satanite, named after the ruler of the fiery realms. Anyway, I'll mix it to the consistency of a watery milkshake, then paint it on using a standard paintbrush. This has no particular effect on the heat qualities of the forge, but it stabilizes the ends wool and keeps particles of the insulation from floating off into the atmosphere where you might inhale them. The whole thing lasts longer. Now some people put an additional coating on top of the Satanite, something like ITC 100 or other refractory coatings which increase the efficiency of the forge. If you have a forge that's probably not going to get bunged up inside, go for it. Now, this particular design gets pretty beat up, so in the past I used ITC 100 and I found that it was really a bit of a waste for this particular forge design. Now there's one more step that I'll be doing later, which is lining the bottom of the forge. This is only necessary if you plan to make Damascus. See, flux, which is necessary for any kind of forge welding, absolutely eats refractory wool up in seconds, so you need a more hardy bottom in your forge. There are a lot of options on that score, including fire brick and castable and so on. But in my case, I'll be lining the bottom of mine with a material called bubble alumina, which is kind of like a refractory version of concrete. Now, I'm not going to show that. Why? Because I don't have the material on hand right now. But we've gotten the forge to a completely functional state now. So as long as I don't do any forge welding, we're good to go. For now, I'm going to go ahead and cure it and give it a little shakedown cruise to make sure that everything's running properly. You want to let the mortar dry, then slowly sort of pulse your heat, starting low and just running it for a few seconds, then turning it off for a while and repeating over a period of an hour or so, ramping up your heat as you go. The point of this is to drive out any remaining water in a mellow, slow sort of way especially if you have something like bubble alumina or castable or whatever that have a lot of water in them. They'll expand and contract and eventually if they're thick enough they'll actually explode as the water turns to steam. So there's no need to stampede towards getting this thing real hot. But there we are eventually, a nice new forge running perfectly. It's like having a brand new forge you know, when you run a forge every day, it's kind of like a boiled frog type thing where you forget how efficiently it used to run because it kind of degrades every, every day a tiny little bit and you don't really notice how bad things have gotten. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much more rapidly this one comes to heat and uh, definitely it'll get to a higher temperature than the old version did. Now, of course, uh, it worked, the old one worked fine, we could still weld in it and everything, but it took a lot more gas to get you there. Alright, so fantastic, we're done, and we're ready to get back to the real job, which is making knives. Alright, thanks for stopping in, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!